Shower thoughts. Why scientists should spend more time in the rain. A thinking of biology essay published in Bioscience, a journal of the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Read by John Van Stan. When caught in the rain, we have all run for cover, often to a nearby tree. On the way, we step over ephemeral puddles and hastily formed streams, marveling at how quickly the soil changes from supportive and predictable to untrustworthy, slippery, soft, and spongy. Waiting out the storm, we may move to avoid the increasingly drippy areas overhead, eventually leaning on the trunk to rest. Then, as the canopy saturates, water flows down the bark in rivulets soaking our backs. Perhaps we escape at first chance, forgoing further observation. However, for natural scientists, researchers, educators, and students, these experiences can reveal ephemeral phenomena, prompting curiosity and novel insights. Human observation during storms has profoundly affected our understanding of ecosystems, from the earliest recorded botanical observations by Theophrastus in his Historia Plantarum and indigenous practices. For example, the Bimbache community of El Hierro in the Canary Islands observed water running down tree bark during fog events and captured it for drinking, washing, and agriculture. If more contemporary hydrologists had watched the raking of fog by trees, forest managers may not have logged the Bull Run watershed in Portland, Oregon, which reduced the local precipitation inputs by 30%. Given that direct observations are often infeasible, remote observation systems are crucial for capturing phenomena that are frequent, long-lasting, or not easily predicted. But this introduces limitations to what we perceive. An unintended consequence of their deployment is that many scientists may not enter the storm instead forming perceptions on the basis of sensor data while staying dry. Consequently, their scope of inferences and ponderings may omit the impacts, flows, and drips that transport water through ecosystems during storms. So what stormy phenomena remain unknown, or are overlooked or misunderstood, because of our absence in ecosystems during foggy, rainy, or snowy periods? Could our dry and technological biases limit the progress of natural science by constraining the what-if and I-wonder-how musings that often inspire research and enrich environmental education? Water science faces criticism regarding its alleged conceptual and theoretical stagnation because of a, quote, techno-optimism that tries to solve all problems despite not asking fundamental questions, end quote. We argue that this issue extends beyond water science, because modern natural scientists often approach their study systems beneath an umbrella perspective, a limited viewpoint that obscures phenomena occurring just before, during, and after storms. Consistent with this thesis, philosopher Martin Heidegger argued that, quote, modern technology is not applied to natural science, Far more often is modern natural science the application of the essence of technology. End quote. Therefore, although remote sensing and virtual experimentation with models are useful, their utility is limited because they cannot measure or test the phenomena or hypotheses that we have not yet observed or imagined. Mitigating these blind spots through mindful observations throughout storms may yield various benefits including improved leveraging of technological sensing, sampling, and models. Real-time observation of storm-related phenomena could shine light on processes currently shadowed beneath umbrella perspectives. Indeed, many scientific breakthroughs were not products of technological advancement itself, but were enabled by using new technology as an extension of the human observation system and imagination. An example of the former may be Antoine Laurent Lavoisier's early hydrogeological research. An example of the latter, eddy covariance systems, which permit verification of theoretical estimates of momentum, heat, and gas exchanges from ecosystems. But humans are sophisticated sensor systems themselves, with high-frequency sound, sight, and smell detection, integrated with distributed temperature and pressure sensing across our bodies. However, we have many limitations. For example, 
being relativistic, uncalibrated or state-dependent, or having low recording capacity and biased memory. Technology, of course, counters these limitations but is most effective when complemented by human input. Human experience in the storm builds our intuition, motivating the expansion of technology's observational capabilities. Finally, the shower thoughts of scientists integrate technological observations, model hypotheses, and field realities into general theory for further testing. In the present article, we present examples across disciplines focused on forests as evidence of the need for natural scientists to emerge from beneath the umbrella and get wet. Accelerating climatic changes and the number of extreme events add urgency and opportunity to this cause. The amount, frequency, and intensity of precipitation are increasing in many parts of the world. Therefore, whatever happens when it is wet and stormy, more of it is coming to a forest not so far from you. Scientists are increasingly attentive to how such precipitation shifts affect ecosystems. But there are still signs of a dry bias. This bias likely varies geographically and by discipline, seeming less evident in research inherently tied to wet conditions like amphibian studies, and regional to global scale studies using remote sensing and modeling methods, than in smaller scale studies, i.e. the scale of human experience. For example, recent years have birthed a plethora of research focused on how drought affects plant-environment interactions at the scale of individual plants or small plant communities, possibly because drought impacts are more visually apparent and convenient to observe. But global warming has approximately equal impact on dry and wet extremes. And precipitation is increasing on average at the global scale. So, it is problematic if fewer scientists are watching their systems more closely in and directly after storm events, as they do during and after drought. Or, experimenting with increased precipitation or simulated flooding, compared with the seemingly ubiquitous rain-out shelter. Changing precipitation regimes interact with changing disturbance regimes, such that effects compound. In vegetated ecosystems, disturbances that become more severe with climate change, such as fire and infestation, can alter the amount and quality of canopy surfaces affecting canopy storm interactions, like the canopy's ability to moderate intense rainfall, which can lead to ecosystem consequences, like increasing soil erosion. And as these changes take place, it becomes increasingly important for researchers and students to actively observe and experience the dynamic processes occurring within these ecosystems during storms. This first-hand exposure to storm-related phenomena helps to build a more comprehensive understanding of the complex interplay between climate change, disturbances, and ecosystem responses. By engaging in direct observation, scientists and students can identify new patterns and relationships that may otherwise go unnoticed in a rapidly changing environment. Therefore, we suggest that natural scientists and students who study the impacts of climate change on ecosystems have a special need to get wet, literally and figuratively. Experiencing storm-related phenomena directly can enhance pedagogy by deepening students' understanding, fostering curiosity, and strengthening their connection to nature. This hands-on approach enriches all levels of environmental education, inspires research, and prepares future scientists for impactful contributions. So what's beyond our umbrella science? Here are some examples from forests, starting with ecohydrology. Our umbrella perspective has resulted in ecosystem scientists knowing little about the filling and emptying of water within forest components as it drains through the overstory, understory, litter, and soil, or evaporates to the atmosphere. Reviews on rain canopy and snow canopy interactions show that many land surface models have severely limited observational bases for storage estimates, have substantial variability in process representation, or are missing spatiotemporally concentrated fluxes between reservoirs, such as the water that drains down plant stems or stem flow. Depending on the interactions between storm and canopy conditions, surfaces may be saturated in minutes, but this water could evaporate over the following hours or days for snow. 
Land surface models, however, often compute canopy water and energy balances with a fixed time step that may be inconsistent with evaporation's actual timing. This can result in models predicting the canopy is dry when in reality it is wet. In addition, the seasonal precipitation timing, associated meteorological conditions, and type like rain, snow, mixed, etc., can play significant roles in canopy water storage, retention, and redistribution to the surface, with significant downgradient effects on rivers and water management. Solving such issues with technology is challenging. Sensors measuring humidity and water vapor flux over canopies may see less precisely during or may be blinded by precipitation. This results in blind spots regarding related cycles such as carbon, measured by eddy covariance. Even when technology is properly monitoring areas of interest, moisture contributions from low-lying fog events, vapor trapped beneath the canopy, or condensate plumes may sneak into or out of the system undetected by remote sensors. Catching these phenomena with human eyes could inform canopy water budgets and amelioration of leaf water deficits. In cold regions or seasons, technological monitoring may miss snow redistributed from canopies to the surface via wind, sublimation, or meltwater drainage driven by a tree's low bark albedo or internal heat. All of this can affect snow water storage estimates at scales relevant to forest and water management. These issues result in land surface models using a wide variety of formulae and parameters for storm vegetation interactions, indicating that we have a poor understanding of how to model these processes at large scales. Therefore, direct observations from scientists regarding when and where unique ecohydrological conditions emerge could result in a synergy between human observation and technological advancement. Now for some examples on biogeochemistry and microbial ecology. Storms can rapidly soak ecosystems, accelerating the flushing, recharge, runoff, and transport of solids and solutes, reactivating interactions with microorganisms, acting as stirrers to force reactions outside of equilibrium or steady states. As climates change, stirring is changing too as storm frequencies or intensities increase in some regions and decrease in others, or vary in timing as seasonality changes. All of these cases will have biogeochemical implications. Predicting where and when hot spots and hot moments will arise in relation to storm events is, however, not straightforward. Forests provide clues for human observers to infer where storm-related biogeochemical hot moments may arise. Beginning with the water itself, forest canopies intercept and redistribute stormwater, creating localized drip points under which throughfall inputs can be more than 10 times greater than open rain. If several branches efficiently capture and drain stormwaters to the stem, Rainwater inputs to near-stem soils can be more than 100 times greater. Downed coarse woody debris has also been found to collect and redirect rainwater to a concentrated area. Canopy draining stormwaters flush substantial quantities, but which are highly unpredictable across space and time, of inorganic nutrients and dissolved organic matter, often called tree dom. Tree dom visibly colors these waters. It carries more easily available organic carbon to forest floors than is exported via streams or stored within the ecosystem and may be critical to forest net carbon storage and export. Such localized inputs of easily available carbon and energy can boost microbial activity in hot spots over a short time. Canopy stormwaters also carry biota, including millions of metazoans per tree per year and billions of fungal spores per hectare per year, including newly discovered fungal species. The belated study of many aqueous hotspots and hot moments is surprising, because they are visible to the human eye, albeit potentially missed by soil moisture sensors or lysimeters. These often overlooked fluxes are not only apparent, they are impactful. Where visually apparent nutrient-rich waters enter dry soils, they can guide observers to potential localized sites to technologically monitor the ensuing bursts of decomposition and mineralization that produce carbon dioxide and inorganic nitrogen. 
Such short-term water fluxes can release nutrients from microbes through lysis, and when enriched with dissolved nutrients and organic carbon, they can trigger microbial activities and mineral weathering in deep soil, which favors new clay mineral formation under incongruent weathering, or priming of organic matter decomposition under congruent weathering. Visibly localized water fluxes may also form anaerobic soil microsites, subsequently spurring microbes to switch to alternative terminal electron acceptors and proliferating a diversity of microbial metabolisms, including denitrification, manganese and iron reduction, and methanogenesis in forest soils. Forest soils that are typically sinks for methane can shift to become sources when wet and anoxic conditions favor methanogenesis. Temporal trends show that methane uptake by forest soils may decline with increasing precipitation. However, measurements and therefore knowledge of soil-atmosphere gas exchanges are often discontinuous and biased towards dry or steady-state conditions. Although automated infrastructure for monitoring gas flux exists, it is expensive, logistically challenging, and spatially limited, potentially missing hot spots. Microbial activities associated with transient storm-related niches are observable by scientists who persist through the rain. Oil-like sheen and rust-color particles on some puddles can appear in forests, reflecting iron-oxidizing bacteria in microsites of elevated or altered nutrient cycles. Such fluctuations between ferrous and ferric oxidation states also yield insights into interconnected cycles of other elements and molecules, including sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, biominerals, other metal or metalloid transformations, organic carbon turnover, lignin and cellulose decomposition, and methane production. Other visually observable cues of storm-related microbial activity can relate to elemental sulfur, like white or pale yellow deposits, or green chloroplasts of photosynthesizing cyanobacteria and algae. Smells can also cue humans into ephemeral microbial activities. Hydrogen sulfide gas from sulfate-reducing microbes smells like rotten eggs. Although sulfate reduction and sulfide gas formation are anaerobic processes, well-drained and well-aerated soils can develop anoxic microsites and host sulfate-reducing microbes who await favorable conditions. The smell of fresh rain is also microbially generated, mainly from terpenoids produced by Streptomyces bacteria and filamentous fungi. Following their noses, scientists have been led to interesting discoveries like those of Bescher and colleagues in 2020, which showed that these terpenoids attract springtails to aid in long-distance spore dispersal. And now let us consider some examples from vegetation functions. For leaves, bark and epiphytes are often wet. Their wetness can be estimated using sensors and energy balance models, but these approaches may not reveal the incredible variation among leaf surfaces. This variability in wetness has wide-reaching impacts. A few examples include reducing or enhancing carbon uptake, altering pathways of precipitation to the ground, providing opportunities for leaf and stem water uptake and rehydration, and capturing substantial moisture in barks and deadwood. In addition to the wetness state, the rapidity of transitions from wet to dry canopy conditions may also be consequential. For example, a recent study of a Japanese cypress forest showed that carbon dioxide uptake in the first few hours following periods of leaf wetness was higher than during typical dry periods. Rain not only wets leaves, but also renders light more diffuse, which can boost photosynthesis. Leaf gas exchange measurements are among the most common activities of plant ecologists. But Barry and Goldsmith in 2020 only found three studies that assessed effects of leaf wetting on this key interface between the biosphere and atmosphere, and only found eight studies that focused on effects of diffuse light, with most of those studies lacking realism because they were conducted indoors away from the rain and clouds. Wandering a rain-soaked forest reveals the multitude of ways plants take advantage of storm-induced flow pathways. Rainy visits to Lord Howe Island off the coast of Australia led Biddick and colleagues to discover roots above ground, 
that harvest water from preferential flow paths through the plant's own gutter-like leaves and branch channels. Mosses, lichens, and other non-vascular epiphytes adapted to anhydrobiosis are dependent on canopy storm-related hydration-dehydration cycles, such as stem flow or storage and evaporation of water within bark. Because epiphytes depend on atmospheric water sources, observation of the type, intensity, and dynamics of precipitation becomes crucial to understanding their ecophysiology and their effect on ecosystem function. In some forests, the color of cyanolichens changes as they saturate with the storm from white to green because of the chlorophyll, a color change that signals other biophysical changes, including fixation of atmospheric nitrogen, variation in albedo, and therefore a change of surface temperature. Storm waters often exceed the water storage capacity of epiphytic vegetation, leading to overflow and nutrient leaching from the canopy. Following these storm water and nutrient pulses, dry landscapes transform in ways that may unveil avenues toward the discovery of new life and processes. On to a few examples from animal behavior. Our umbrella perspective may conceal or misinterpret important animal behaviors and animal-environment interactions. For example, koalas were often described as not needing to drink, because they were rarely observed doing so. Opportunistic observations during storms revealed, though, that koalas drink stem flow. Because koalas spend most of their time in trees, and because storms make it hard to look upward, the natural drinking behavior of koalas was overlooked for scientists designed dry and comfortable observation methods. Improved understanding of koalas' physiological need for free water has consequences for their conservation and habitat management. Maned sloths, Bradypus torquatus, share a similar story. Ecologists caught in a storm observed a sloth drinking from a branch flow path for the first time and reported it in 2021. Because this behavior had never been recorded before, it was previously assumed that sloths did not spontaneously ingest free water. Insect behaviors have also been observed to change during storms. Masvich and Moog in 2000 reported that an ant colony prevented their bamboo nest from flooding by communally drinking storm waters, then urinating in an area that would drain away from the nest. Rapid changes in humidity and air pressure can influence insect behavior but these effects have primarily been studied during the dry periods between storms. Those studies that have reported observations regarding the effects of humidity on insect behavior before, during, and after storms have progressed theory. Approaching storms can increase foraging time for a honeybee species, Apis mellifera, and it can reduce mating activities in three taxonomically unrelated insect species. Immediately after storms, Insect foraging behavior increases because the higher humidity reduces desiccation risk and the stormwaters can uncover resources. Therefore, our future presence in the storm could help uncover disregarded or overlooked aspects regarding how animals shelter, feed, hydrate, and die. On to some examples from Earth and planetary surface processes. Forest redistribution of stormwaters may influence sediment routing through watersheds, imparting biosignatures to underlying soils and sediments that are useful to reconstruct the distribution of forests through deep time. Therefore, scientists' observations of and experiences in stormy forests today support efforts to understand Earth's geologic history and modern interactions within and between terrestrial and aquatic systems. For example, by the time storm events mobilize sediment along hill slopes and stream channels, the hydrologic information is already modified by the watershed effects that include the forest's interception, capture, and routing of water to or through soils. Integrated over that forest's lifetime, which may be thousands to millions of years, precipitation partitioning by vegetation is one of the innumerable sedimentary processes that must be considered when reconstructing important components of Earth history from the sedimentary record, including paleoclimate, sea level change, and tectonics. When canopies discharge intercepted water through drip points or stem flow, this can localize hydrologic, geomorphic, and sedimentary processes. 
Therefore, observations of canopy stormwater routing may inspire novel hypotheses regarding these waters' capability to produce biosignatures. In other words, any morphological, chemical, or isotopic traces from an organism. Known forest biosignatures include precipitation of cements, possibly microbially aided, and rhizoliths, or the opposite, the formation of dissolution features. Finally, geomorphologists visiting landscapes during storms may open creative avenues for interpreting landscape features on other planets. The use of Earth-based analogs to explain geomorphological processes on other planetary bodies is a well-established method. For example, comparison of sediment routing by storms through watersheds with forest canopies versus bare earth watersheds, and its eventual deposition, remains an unexplored space that could yield reasonable criteria for identifying forest biosignatures on planetary bodies. Now we discuss how the umbrella perspective affects Earth system models. Earth system models contain many dry concepts that are applied to intrinsically wet conditions and systems, from the tops of trees to the ground surface and even through soils. For example, the amount of rainwater retained in tree canopies is often estimated in these models theoretically, as about one-tenth to two-tenths of a millimeter of storage per leaf area index. And this is, in a sense, a dry equation that estimates low canopy water storage capacities ranging from about one-tenth to two millimeters. The representation of precipitation intercepting vegetation structure itself by these models is challenging, especially regarding disturbance effects and non-leaf components. But wet scientists have observed additional water storage in non-leaf components, such as epiphytes, water-filled tree holes, and bark structures, that collectively result in storage capacities exceeding the dry equation estimates by many times in many regions. A consequence of underestimating canopy water storage, and particularly underestimating evaporation from wet leaf surfaces and epiphytes, is a large potential bias in surface temperature simulated by these models, up to negative 0.6 Kelvin globally. Some ESM process representations of water storage by canopies are not completely dry, but they may rely on few local observations collected by wet scientists. These damp model representations may rely on too few, too limited, or too localized wet observations to saturate theory with a robust set of observational support across systems. For example, Lundquist and colleagues in 2021 found that these model representations of forest snow interception are based on data collected from just two storms in Idaho. It is perhaps no wonder, then, that these damp models have large uncertainties in their predictions of snowy forested regions' hydrologic response to climate change. Stormwater stored on leaves influences canopy conductance. This affects these models' estimates of carbon fixation and transpiration. However, Earth system models either deploy literally dry equations, ignoring the effect of canopy wetness on conductance, or halt gas exchange when leaves are wet. Evidence from wet leaf observations, including direct measurements of wet leaf photosynthesis, demonstrate that these dry modeling approaches and assumptions are incorrect. Scientists' observations and shower thoughts on this topic are crucial because plant gas exchange methods lag behind advances in understanding canopy wetting patterns. For epiphytes, the relevance of stormwater storage has been questioned, as they were assumed to be regularly close to saturation. Field observations and process-based modeling have shown, however, that saturation only occurs approximately 20% of the time, supporting these epiphytes' inclusions in such models, making the equations wetter. Although process-based vegetation models can represent fast water pool dynamics during storms, they still lack key processes at the intersection of ecophysiology and biogeochemistry that regularly occur during these hot moments. For example, respiration pulses in non-vascular epiphytes on rewetting can affect their long-term carbon balance, and storm rewetting can lead to nutrient release pulses in tropical non-vascular epiphytes affecting organisms' nutrient budget and whole forest cycling. 
Epiphytes remain neglected in most major Earth system models, making these models dry in both parameterization and at the process level. Given that storm ecosystem interactions contribute to landscape evolution, ESM's dry process representations can influence our understanding of the past. A key example of this is the stream power law, which relates local channel bed incision to the area and slope of the contributing watershed. In application, this relationship allows the simulation of landscape evolution through deep time with minimal computational cost. Although an intrinsically dry geometric scaling law, additional realism of our wet world was instilled by an adaptation to consider bedrock weathering rates as a function of precipitation gradients across watersheds accelerated by carbon and nutrient flushes. Below the surface, rapid bypass flow through soil macropores occurring during storms can represent 1 to 70% of subsurface water movement often influencing water and solute exports from ecosystems. However, Earth system models rely on a damp representation of subsurface flow, the Buckingham-Richards equation. This is a uniform flow equation derived from rigorous but over-controlled lab conditions. Although Earth system models will always be necessarily incomplete, the observations and shower thoughts of wet scientists will be useful in pointing us toward areas and conditions where sampling and technological monitoring may best help hydrate established but dry modeling approaches. Now join us as we discuss how soaking in ideas can make environmental education more immersive. Fostering a solid foundation for future work requires integrating the innovative thinking inspired by shower thoughts into environmental education. Experiences that encourage immersion in natural environments during storms may be key to leveraging technology, uniting human observation, modeling, and remote sensing to advance knowledge across generations. Immersive learning should expose students and researchers at all career stages to the broadest possible range of ecosystem conditions. Imagination and technology are powerful tools, but perhaps it will be the personal presence of educators and students that inspires creative solutions to the current limitations in model representations of stormy phenomena and the ecosystem structures and disturbances that affect them. Importantly, student experiences in storms can be both targeted at known emergent phenomena, such as the examples provided, and given the freedom to explore and discover. When student experiences become too narrowly targeted by educators, we risk treating students like technological sensors themselves, and thereby risk constraining their personal ability to muse over something that may deepen their wonder and appreciation of nature, and ultimately, a broader community's understanding of and connection to the ecosystems in which they live. On this subject, philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once wrote, quote, Beware of interrupting a student's naive, confident, and, as it were, immediate and personal relationship with nature. The woods, the rocks, the winds, the vulture, the flowers, the butterfly, the meads, the mountain slopes, must all speak to them in their own language. In them, one must, as it were, come to know oneself again in countless reflections and images, in a variegated round of changing visions, and in this way, one will unconsciously and gradually feel the metaphysical unity of all things in the great image of nature, and at the same time, tranquilize one's soul in the contemplation of her eternal endurance and necessity. End quote. Encouraging mindfulness and direct observations of phenomena during storms across disciplines may lead to discoveries that bridge gaps in knowledge and foster a more holistic understanding of ecosystems. Therefore, rather than charting specific future directions, we invite students, educators, and researchers alike to engage with nature during storms, embracing the potential for new insights and deeper connections to the world around them. After all, who knows what another's eyes, nose, skin, or ears may discover? 
and how it may empower researchers to advance ecosystem science and inform sustainable management practices, all while nurturing their connection to the natural world. So in conclusion, let's close the umbrella. Natural scientists seem increasingly content to stay dry and rely on remote sensors and samplers, models, and virtual experiments to understand natural systems. Consequently, we can miss important stormy phenomena, imaginative inspirations, and opportunities to build intuition, all of which are critical to scientific progress. The limitations of a dry umbrella perspective will likely become more costly as global average precipitation continues to rise, and as precipitation increases in frequency and intensity in many regions of the world. For example, local, regional, and global-scale studies of forests have revealed somewhat surprising negative anomalies in plant productivity and photosynthetic activity that correspond with wetter conditions. But these forest responses to precipitation remain mysterious because they are understudied. Therefore, like others, we call for expanded study of the impacts of anomalously wet events and seasons to parallel the one-sided proliferation of drought studies. The combination of human experiences in the storm, our shower thoughts, with technological tools arguably produce the best odds for scientific advancement. Although we focused on forests, the shade of our sheltered umbrella perspective likely darkens our understanding of all natural and human systems. Storms produce even more important event-driven processes in semi-arid ecosystems, whose response is not buffered by the forest canopy. Our call, therefore, is for those who study natural and socio-ecological systems to enter the storm, with caution, of course, to collect human observations that complement other methods. We also challenge funding agencies, many of which have tilted support toward remote sensing, to explicitly support activities that place researchers in the storm. That's the end of our Shower Thoughts for now. May you become outstanding in your field by being outstanding in your field during the rain. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.